When it comes to the Necromancer in Diablo 4, there's never been any shortage of incredibly powerful builds for you to pilot on this class, what can arguably be considered the most famous build that the Necromancer has at its disposal, and that's the Infinimus Necromancer. Now, if you've been following this channel for a long time, you'll know I'm a pretty big fan of Infinimus, even going so far as to giving it its namesake before the game even released. And I've put out a ton of videos on how the build works, what you need to understand about it, the different mechanics, etc. But every single day, I will get DM'd privately on Discord, on Twitter, in YouTube comments, get pinged on Reddit or in different discords, asking me what I generally consider to be pretty foundational or core questions, just about how the build functions at a base level, and then numerous iterations on how to make it better, how to change different items, why I use one thing over another, etc, etc. So what I would like to do is put out basically a, a macro teaches little mini series here, maybe like two to three videos covering every single thing that you could need to know about the Infinimus Necromancer. I'm going to try to cut it up into different videos because I don't want to be overloading you with an hour long video that nobody watches and ultimately still have to answer all those very same questions because as much as I love answering those questions, there's only so many times I can re-explain the differences between Reap and Decompose, the differences between using Blight and using Sever or using Neither, why we use Explosive Mist, why would we take it off the build, why am I not using Lidless, do I care about Bone Storm? So I want to try to create this little miniature package that anybody who ever asks a question can just get reference to. So in this video, I'm going to keep it pretty basic. I'm just going to break down a couple of things that I think might be interesting for you to know about the build, but also just so you walk away with a core understanding of it, so you know why there are different variants, so that you can make those decisions yourself. You have that information. Because I can't stress this enough, there's been a lot of questions about the Infinimus Necromancer. And when I say a lot, I mean this is just the first half of the first page of Google results with Infinimus question in Reddit in the title. As you can see, a lot of people have walked away not fully understanding what the build is meant to do, and ultimately are at a loss for how they themselves can pilot it, take ownership of it, and work on it themselves. But I figured let's start with a quick history of Infinimus, because I think a lot of people are not necessarily even aware of where this build comes from, because when this thing started off, it looks a lot different than what it looks like today. Going as far back as March 26th of this year, three months before the game even released, I put out my first video covering the Infinimus Necromancer. And for people who weren't able to play the betas that nobody can talk about before the open betas happen, while I can't go into excruciating detail, I myself and a lot of other players got over a thousand hours in this game before it even came out. And the de facto build for the Necromancer was the Infinimus Necro. Now at that time it didn't have a catchy title, we were thinking about what to call it because ultimately we were going to cover this build on max roll. And the core conceit of the build is not a corpse explosion build, it's not even really a shadow damage build. It's just that Blood Mist can go infinite with the inclusion of a single aspect. Reason is because the namesake aspect Explosive Mist looked a lot different back in the day than what it does now. So Explosive Mist used to say that while Blood Mist was active, it would trigger corpse explosion on surrounding corpses. And then every time that it detonated a corpse, it would reduce its cooldown by up to 1.5 seconds. But the reason why this was so much more powerful than it is today is because it would trigger on every single corpse that the Necromancer ran over while in Blood Mist. Meaning that mowing through an entire field of monsters with nothing else going on would completely reset its duration every single time. You'll notice in the gameplay that you're looking at right now, this is actually a Blood Surge build for the AoE damage, and then Blood Mist for the single target. You notice as we run over all the different corpses while in Mist, it's going to consume every single corpse, exploding them and reducing the cooldown all the way down to zero. You'll also notice that Decrepify isn't on our skill bar, because that was actually an innovation that Nakabon the Absolute Legend would bring to the build after Explosive Mist had been nerfed, so that it only triggered three times in total, regardless of the number of corpses you ran over. Back in the preseason, when most Necromancer builds were completely unable of pushing Nightmare Dungeons at all, we were all looking for an answer to the question, how can you possibly survive the damage while successfully doing enough damage to actually clear Nightmare Dungeon 100? What Nicobon brought to the build was this innovation moving over to the use of Decrepify, abhorrent Decrepify saying that you will reduce your cooldowns every opportunity with a 15% chance whenever you deal damage to a target. 
What this allowed the build to do was not only return to the true Infinimus route, where you're able to perpetually stay in Blood Mist to be immune to damage the entire time, but would actually go even further to bring on the additional value of being able to spam Bone Storm, because that cooldown was being reduced as well, and then being able to rely on Shielding Storm for a massive amount of barrier generation meaning that you were effectively immune when you were out of Blood Mist, and when you were in Blood Mist, you were actually immune. Nicobon popularizing this version of the Infinimus build, which originally had dubbed as Shadow Ball or Shadow Blood Mist, opened up the floodgates for innovation on the build, and would lead to one of the core defining features of the Infinimus Necromancer. And that's that, realistically, it's not a damage over time build at all but instead it is looking to proc as many effects simultaneously as possible. Most notably Shadow Blight, an instant of damage from the key passive which is able to crit, which before they had changed the damage buckets was one of the only way to get a legitimate amount of scaling damage onto your build. And the reason why even early on, Infinimus's entire identity had swapped over to instantaneous critical strike damage, where the corpse explosions and their damage over time really played a backseat role in the ultimate engine of the build, as opposed to being the forefront damage source. So now that you have a better idea of the history of the build and where its roots are and how it has come to be, let's talk about that main engine, the purpose of the build, and why I say that Infinimus realistically is a crit focused build. And the reason why I'm even putting that into air quotes is because I think dubbing it as the crit focused version of it just isn't an accurate portrayal of the build. Ultimately, Corpse Explosion is not your major damage source. You are a proc build that's looking to stack lucky hit effects to trigger different abilities, which is very obvious to see in the modern day iteration of the build where you're using X-Fall's Corroded Signet, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let's go ahead and just look in the game at the base core engine so that you can walk away understanding what is it meant to do. Now, I know I'm gonna lose people immediately, but while Explosive Mist absolutely continues to define the base experience of the Infinimus Necromancer, ultimately at this stage in the game, it's actually not powerful enough or important enough to continue to include on the build with the introduction of two very specific rings, those being the Sacrilegious Soul and X-Fall's Corroded Signet. Before the introduction of the Sacrilegious Soul, Explosive Mist was required on the build to be able to automate your corpse explosion so that as you're moving through Blood Mist, you continue to lay down damage. With the introduction of Sacrilegious Soul, this is no longer the case. And while you can still use the two of them together to double up your procs, it turns out that Sacrilegious Soul is just incredibly more valuable and efficient than Explosive Mist is. But until you have access to any of these unique rings, it continues to be the mainstay of the build and ultimately informs everything that you're attempting to accomplish with the build itself. Blood Mist is going to grant complete immunity. It's also going to grant you the unstoppable effect, which is going to be important for modern day iterations of the build. But most notably, it actually reduces your speed on use and it's going to do a very small amount of damage to every single target within range over the length of its duration while simultaneously healing you. So if you are using Blood Mist to get out of a dangerous situation, you will typically come back out of Blood Mist at full health, one of the most important facets of the build that typically gets overlooked. The key modifier for Blood Mist says that it's going to generate corpses as it goes. In total, it will create four corpses, and if you're using Explosive Mist on the build, it will actually consume three of those corpses over the time, leaving a single corpse behind, which is also incredibly important for the major survivability and crowd control aspects of the build, which we'll get into in just a second. Explosive Mist triggering Corpse Explosion will cast your character's version of Corpse Explosion, meaning that it will read all ranks of Corpse Explosion, casting at the highest value that you have, and also reading any modifiers. This is how you're able to use Blighted Corpse Explosion to leave behind miasmas of corpse damage that are going to deal shadow damage over time, and this is incredibly important for two passives that are legitimately the true identity of the build and what most people have the hardest time coming to understand as the basis of it. Cute Flesh is the true engine of this build. It is a lucky hit ability which can be triggered off of any sources of damage that are dealt to the target and has a chance to generate a corpse. This is doubled on bosses and triggers off of every instance of damage. So as Corpse Explosion will actually deal two instances of damage per second for six seconds, meaning every Corpse Explosion does a total of 12 damage instances, 
you have a chance to generate a corpse on every single one of those. And as you stack up more corpse explosions on the target, that means that you are increasing the total ticks that can possibly proc cued flesh. Now it may seem very obvious that being able to cast as many corpse explosions as possible for the most damage as possible is ultimately the most important thing for the build, but truly we're just looking to proc huge flesh as often as possible to be able to trigger more corpses. Well, why do we need to be able to trigger more corpse explosions to be able to do damage in some other way? Nakabon's innovation with Abhorrent Decrepify, which is your second most important lucky hit trigger here, says that whenever you hit a target, so similar to Hued Flesh, where Corpse Explosion has the opportunity to hit a target up to 12 times per cast, you have a 15% chance to reduce all of your active cooldowns by one second, not only resetting Blood Mist so that you can effectively stay in it infinitely, but going even further to be able to reduce the cooldown on Corpse Tendrils, our most important crowd control effect, as well as reducing the cooldown of Bone Storm, a tool which has become increasingly important and ultimately one of the most important parts of the build, moving into season two. And coming to understand Abhorrent Decrepify and what can and cannot trigger it is incredibly important for piloting this build. And I'll just go ahead and give you a complete wash right here. Basically, every single thing that does damage to a target can trigger Abhorrent Decrepify. You may even notice in the most recent season Abattoir of Zero, people putting a single point into spiked armor because returning Thorn's damage to a target can trigger Abhorrent Decrepify meaning that as your Shielding Storm with Bone Storm keeps you fully barriered, monsters attacking you will further decrease your cooldowns and make it so that key skills like Blood Mist, Corpse Tendrils, and Bone Storm are at your disposal whenever you need them. Now I've talked about Corpse Tendrils a lot here and it's very easy to understand why this would be included into the build. It applies a massive amount of crowd control stunning targets for at least three seconds the moment that it pulls them all in, doing a pixel pull, localizing all the monsters to one area so that all of your damage over time effects and all of your AoE damage is even more effective, and then also applying vulnerable and incredibly important scaler regardless of the version of Infinimus that you're playing. Corpse Tendrils cooldown is even further reduced by Abhorrent Decrepify, and not only that, but Corpse Tendrils attacking every single monster within range is also a great tool for being able to proc Abhorrent Decrepify, as well as being able to proc Cute Flesh as well. And then the build wouldn't be complete without Bone Storm, this pseudo damage over time ability, which actually doesn't do damage over time until you add on another aspect, is going to make it so that we can apply a huge amount of lucky hit procs against the majority of targets within range, be able to stack on an incredible amount of damage reduction, and on the base version of Infinimus, stack on a huge amount of critical strike chance, something that darkness builds don't have an easy time of being able to stack, but this, in combination with Grasping Veins for Corpse Tendrils, means that you can approach near 100% chance to crit, making it so that the Shadow Blight key passive, which is going to trigger a modest amount of shadow damage every 10 times a monster is affected by shadow damage in total, which gives you an outlet of rockable, incredible damage to be able to scale on the build. Again, pointing even further as to why Corpse Explosion, at least on the majority of Infinimus builds, ultimately takes a back seat. Other notable aspects for the build is Ultimate Shadow, which will turn your Bone Storm into a Darkness skill cause it to do shadow damage, as well as apply a secondary shadow damage over time effect, which can proc huge flesh, abhorrent decrepify, as well as trigger blighted, which is a huge amount of multiplicative damage every 10 times that the shadow blight key passive is triggered on an enemy. This will go further to multiply all of your damage sources, all of your critical damage sources like X falls and shadow blight, as well as increasing your corpse explosion damage itself. And then the aspect, which is the hardest for people to wrap their head around, including in the build because it's immediate use doesn't seem incredibly powerful, is the blood soaked aspect. Not only will this make it so that blood mist now leaves behind desecrated ground, a new keyword which can further multiply your damage with the paragon glyph, but it then also applies shadow damage over time, stacking on even more instances of procable damage, and then also removes the movement speed penalty from blood mist. Not that long ago, the infinimus build was actually the fastest necromancer build in the game because blood mist would gain you unstoppable, gaining you access to the ghost walker movement speed buff, Blood Soaked would no longer reduce your cooldown in Blood Mist. So now that you have the history, you understand the base concept about the build, let's go ahead and talk about the three primary variants of the Infinimus Necromancer, or at least the ones that are the most popular, and go over the different nuances. 
These are going to be the standard Infinimist, which is going to effectively be a hybrid between crit damage and damage over time. The X Falls version of Infinimist, which I personally believe is the base best version of Infinimist Necromancer for the majority of content, which is going to fully focus on critical strike damage and critical strike chance, be able to proc massive amounts of explosive damage from X Falls Ring, as well as a good amount of repetitive damage from Shadow Blight. And then lastly, the Corpse Explosion focused version of the build or the Black River variant of the build. This has recently jumped up in fame due to the requirements of Abattoir of Zir to be able to have enough scalable damage and survivability, where the ability to consume a massive amount of corpses to output a huge amount of damage has really begun to shine. So to be able to break down the three different variants, I created this little infographic that you can share and keep just so you can have a quick reference for the different types of damage, items, and your general approach to actually playing the build. The base Infinimus build either does not have any of the uniques that are required to play the other versions or is looking to keep that hybrid version of the build functional. The reason why I say damage type hybrid here is because it's both looking to maximize crit damage, mostly for Shadow Blight procs, but is looking to scale its damage over time to benefit from more things in the Paragon board like the Wither node, which will increase damage over time effects, as well as maintaining a high output from Corpse Explosion damage itself. To be able to scale your damage here, first and foremost, you're going to need Lucky Hit Chance to keep the engine rolling. We are going to use Critical strike damage, but probably not investing heavily into getting a large amount of it. We are going to be stacking vulnerable damage as that multiplier is available across every version of Infinimus and very easy for us to apply. We will be using corpse consumption mechanisms here, like Fueled by Death in the skill tree, as well as the Flesh Eater Legendary node in the Paragon system. And while there are a ton of additive damages that are valuable for the build, most notably we're looking for shadow damage and shadow damage over time, as well as plain damage over time in our affect as well as attack speed, a little known or often overlooked stat that is incredibly valuable for the build. The faster your animations, the faster you cast Corpse Explosion, the faster you're in Blood Mist, the faster Bone Storm is active, the faster Corpse Tendrils is pulling in targets. So while many people will often overlook attack speed, it is incredibly valuable. Most notably, the unique Howl from Below has an incredible amount of attack speed for corpse skills, and if you notice how much faster that animation is in comparison to everything else on your character, you'll start to see the benefits of attack speed. Like I alluded to, the base version of Infinimus will be using the Wither Legendary Node in the Wither Board, giving your damage over time abilities the effective chance of critting, which is further scaled not only the chance, but the damage itself by intelligence on your character. Notable uniques for the build are the iconic Howl from Below, which is going to vastly increase your corpse explosion damage and also make your corpses more effective by having them run along with you, helping to spread your damage further. Here are Tibalt's Will, which are a pair of pants, which gives you additional damage when you gain Unstoppable. The moment that you go into Blood Mist, you have Unstoppable. And then on top of that, even though the drawback is typically that it doesn't have a ton of survivability stats on the build, we are effectively immune the vast majority of the time, so it's not really a drawback for us. We get all of the good with none of the bad. In some versions of the build which aren't using Reap on the skill bar but are instead using Sever or Blight, the additional essence when you become unstoppable from Tibalt's Will is actually a really great way to be able to manage your essence on those builds so you don't have to further invest in any other forms of resource generation. Then notably the Lilith's Wall is going to make an appearance across every single version of this build because it's very easy for us to be able to propagate additional Shadow Bone Storms, which helps to spread our damage, increase our proc rate, as well as maintaining the Blighted aspect as often as possible. The Sacrilegious Soul fits naturally into every version of the Infinimus build, but here and in the Corpse Explosion version, they are definitely at its strongest. Greaves of the Empty Tomb is incredibly valuable since it gives you an additional source of Lucky Hit Chance on boots which you can't normally get, as well as a very valuable form of damage reduction from shadowed targets. Add on to that, the boots are max evade charges for the implicit, movement speed as well as essence cost reduction, which again is slightly more valuable on the Blight and Sever version. And then on top of that, using Sever as a proc for additional damage over time, because the boots will leave behind desecrated ground, similar to the blood soaked aspect. Obviously, Flicker Step is incredibly valuable on the build, and you may ask the question, why do we actually need more sources of reducing our ultimate cooldown in something like Flicker Step when we could be using more valuable boots? And the 
the answer is actually kind of interesting in that the Infinimus build has actually become so strong that we're killing monsters too quickly. The faster you kill a monster, the less damage instances that are required to kill it, the less chances that you have to proc Abhorrent to Crepify. Many people find not having Bone Storm up 100% of the time to be too much of a detriment, so they're willing to sacrifice the bonuses that Greaves of the Empty Tomb, or even the mobility from a really nice pair of legendary boots with the Ghostwalker aspect on it, to be a perfectly fine sacrifice to be able to get that additional cooldown on Bone Storm. While you do not need Flicker Step, if you're looking to speed farm, it's definitely more valuable than other options options. For the X-Falls version of Infinimist, again what I consider to be the standard version of Infinimist, we are dropping all corpse explosion damage, we're actually taking all ranks out of the skill itself except for what's required to be able to actually activate this skill. And we're going to fully invest into critical strike damage, critical strike damage multipliers as well as additive sources as well as stacking on as much critical strike chance as possible. So here for damage killing, we still need lucky hit chance to be able to proc X-Falls as often as possible. And then after that, critical strike chance with critical strike damage. Vulnerable damage continues to be incredibly valuable, as well as the corpse consumption package. And then again, base shadow damage to be able to increase all of our procs as opposed to shadow damage over time or base damage over time effects. And then here attack speed continues to be very valuable. We would not prioritize taking the wither legendary node, regaining those additional paragon points. It's actually really nice to be able to build out to a sixth glyph on your base paragon board setup. And then for notable uniques, you'll see that we actually drop howl from below since again, we don't care about our corpse explosion damage and instead pick up X falls. The reason why we also need to drop howl from below is because we need to be able to fit on an additional aspect in the form of grasping veins and be able to maintain all of the gear that you want, the uniques that you want, as well as the relevant aspect slots means that we cannot afford to be able to use Howl from Blow. Here at Tibalt's Will, Lidless Wall, Sacrilegious Soul, Grease of the Empty Tomb, and Flicker Step are still good for all of the reasons that I previously pointed out. You'll also notice very often on the X-Falls version, people swapping over to using Blight as a 1.1 wonder just to be able to get the 15% additional damage multiplier, as well as be able to stack on additional procs of damage over time to be able to proc X-Falls as often as possible. Or the Corpse Explosion Focus version of Infinimus, this is also known as the Black River version of the Infinimus, we're going to drop all of our critical strike chance and multipliers and opt for full investment in damage over time. Here you're going to get as many ranks to corpse skills across your amulet, your headpiece if you're using Shaco, using Sacrilegious Ring as well as Black River. We're also going to be putting five full ranks into it. For damage scaling, it's actually much harder to get as much lucky hit chance as you need for this build. That's why it's so much better in the Abattoir of Zero, where density is super high and the final boss is actually three different targets. But you'll notice that we drop all critical strike chance and damage, opting purely for vulnerable damage as one of our only available multipliers. Here, the corpse consumption package continues to be valuable. We're going back to shadow damage, any other additive damage that's relevant, including shadow damage over time and plane damage over time. And then again, attack speed is still very important on the build. Yes, we would be using the legendary node for Wither. And then for notable uniques, you'll see that we have incorporated Black River, how from below returns to the build. And then here's where you may be using the Hollow Queen Crest or all the D2 nerds are calling Shaco. Shaco is obviously incredibly valuable since it gives you a huge amount of damage reduction, good survivability, and then plus four ranks to all of our skills. So it's going to vastly increase not only our corpse explosion damage, but also add additional ranks to Blood Mist and Corpse Tendrils to help to reduce their cooldowns as far as possible just from base skill ranks. And then Tibalt's Will, Lidless Wall, Sacrilegious Soul, Grease of the Empty Tomb, and Flicker Step all continue to be valuable. Flicker Step becomes even more valuable since it is harder for us to proc lucky hit chance from the lack of lucky hit on our main weapon, as well as different options across the rest of our gear which will typically eat up even more lucky hit chance opportunities. Keeping these primary variants in mind, the list of unique items which are valuable for them, and then the different damage types that you're looking to scale with them, it'll be easier for you to make decisions, swapping out aspects, and understanding the impact of these things on your build, and why they may or may not be important, even if it's not immediately apparent from a first glance. So now that you've been fully equipped with the history, the methodology, the primary engine, the damage types, and the primary variants, I hope that you're able to walk out and be able to play the game in the most empowered way possible. Look forward to the next two videos where I'm expecting to go into an excruciating amount of detail where I hope to have one of those like always sunny in Philadelphia, what you know, whiteboards with red strings going everywhere, connecting all of the dots so you have a complete breakdown of everything that you could possibly need to to know about how basically 
the necromancer in general works, but how it all very specifically applies to the Infinimist concept. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please do so. It's one of the best ways to help me out and also helps the YouTube algorithm to know that like this channel is making worthwhile content and I would hate for you to miss out on any of these videos, especially the next ones coming in this series. I'd like to give a very specific thank you to all of the members who have joined on the YouTube channel. I honestly just added that function for the few people who watch on Twitch but don't feel comfortable supporting on that platform. The fact that anybody has joined as a member on this channel like warms my heart and goes an incredible long way to be able to help me to make more content like this at the quality that I do and actually get that investment back on time. So thank you all so much. I truly, truly appreciate it. And obviously I wouldn't be doing any of this if it wasn't for the support of the people here on this channel as well as on Twitch. Speaking of all the great support, if you either cannot or do not want to, another great way to be able to support the channel is just be able to like this video. Again, it helps the algorithm to know that this video is of high content and that more people should see it and we can share with more nerds who would definitely benefit from this type of information. And then lastly, please go and participate down in the comments below if you have questions, excited for things that you're hoping to see in the next videos, topics that you really hope that I cover so that they don't get missed. I'd love to hear from you. If you haven't seen on previous videos, I tend to respond to the vast majority of comments as many as I possibly can. So let me know what you're thinking down below. I'd really love to hear from you. As always, thank you so much for watching this video. It truly means the world to me. I hope that it helped. I look forward to seeing you in the next one.